section thirteen of a collection of Beatrix Potter stories by Beatrix Potter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section thirteen: The Tale of Pigling Bland. Narrator read by Adele de Pignoroles. Aunt Pettitoes, read by Esther Benzamenides. Alexander, read by Eddie Sherman. Pigling Bland, read by Johnny Smith. The Policeman, read by Rupert Holliday. And read by Instrument Simonides. Sleepy Head, read by Luki. Cockle, read by Luki. Mr. Peter Piperson, read by Rupert Holliday. Pigwig, read by Rosalind. The Walsh, read by Luki. For Cecily and Charlie, A Tale of the Christmas Pig the tale of pigling bland once upon a time there was an old pig called aunt pettitoes she had eight of a family four little girl pigs called crosspatch suck suck yock yock and spot and four little boy pigs called alexander pigling bland chin chin and stumpy stumpy had had an accident to his tail the eight little pigs had very fine appetites yes 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 they eat and indeed they do eat said aunt pettitoes looking at her family with pride suddenly there were fearful squeals alexander had squeezed inside the hoops of the pig trough and stuck aunt pettitoes and i dragged him out by his hind legs chin chin was already in disgrace it was washing day and he had eaten a piece of soap and presently in a basket of clean clothes we found another dirty little pig shut tut tut whichever is this grunted aunt pettitoes now all the pig family are pink or pink with black spots but this pig child was smutty black all over. When it had been popped into a tub, it proved to be yock yock. I went into the garden. There I found Crosspatch and Suck Suck rooting up carrots. I whipped them myself and led them out by the ears. Crosspatch tried to bite me. Aunt Petty Toes, Aunt Petty Toes, you are a worthy person, but your family is not well brought up. Every one of them has been in mischief, except Spot and Pigling Bland. Yes, yes, sighed Aunt Petty Toes. And they drink bucketfuls of milk. I shall have to get another cow. Good little Spot shall stay at home to do the housework, but the others must go. Four little boy pigs and four little girl pigs are too many altogether. Yes, 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 said Aunt Pettitoes. There will be more to eat without them. So Chin Chin and Suck Suck went away in a wheelbarrow, and Stumpy, Yock Yock, and Crosspatch rode away in a cart. And the other two little boy pigs, Pigling Bland and Alexander, went to market. We brushed their coats, we curled their tails and washed their little faces, and wished them good-bye in the yard. Aunt Pettitoes wiped their eyes with a large pocket handkerchief. Then she wiped Pigling Bland's nose and shed tears. Then she wiped Alexander's nose and shed tears. Then she passed the handkerchief to Spot. Aunt Pettitoes sighed and grunted, and addressed those little pigs as follows. Now, Pigling Bland, son, Pigling Bland, you must go to market. Take your brother Alexander by the hand. Mind your Sunday clothes, and remember to blow your nose. Aunt Pettitoes passed round the handkerchief again. Beware of traps, hen roosts, bacon and eggs. Always walk upon your hind legs. Pigling Bland, who was a sedate little pig, looked solemnly at his mother. A tear trickled down his cheek. Aunt Pettitoes turned to the other. Now, son Alexander, take the hand. Wee, 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 giggled Alexander. Take the hand of your brother Pigling Bland. You must go to market. Mind. Wee, 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 interrupted Alexander again. You put me out, said Aunt Pettitoes. Observe signposts and milestones. Do not gobble herring bones. And remember, said I impressively, if you once cross the county border, you cannot come back. Alexander, you are not attending. Here are two licenses permitting two pigs to go to market in Lancashire. Attend, Alexander. I have had no end of trouble getting these papers from the policeman. Pigling Bland listened gravely. Alexander was hopelessly volatile. I pinned the papers for safety inside their waistcoat pockets. Aunt Pettitoes gave to each a little bundle, and ate conversation peppermints with appropriate moral sentiments in screws of paper. Then they started. Pigling Bland and Alexander trotted along steadily for a mile. At least Pigling Bland did. Alexander made the road half as long again from skipping from side to side. He danced about and pinched his brother, singing, This pig went to market. This pig stayed home. This pig had a bit of meat. Let's see what they've given us for dinner, pigling. 
Pigwing Blin and Alexander sat down and then tied their bundles. Alexander gobbled up his dinner in no time. He had already eaten all his own peppermints. Give me one of yours, please, Pigling. But I wish to preserve them for emergencies, said Pigling Blin doubtfully. Alexander went into squeals of laughter. Then he pricked Pigling with the pin that had fastened his pig paper, and when Pigling slapped him, he dropped the pin, and tried to take Pigling's pin, and the papers got mixed up. Pigling Bland reproved Alexander. But presently they made it up again, and trotted away together, singing, Tom, Tom, the piper's son, stole a pig and away he ran. But all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. What's that, young sirs? Stole a pig? Where are your licenses? said the policeman. They had nearly run against him round a corner. Pigling Bland pulled out his paper. Alexander, after fumbling, handed over something scrumply. To two and a half ounce conversation, sweeties, at three farthings. What's this? This ain't a license. Alexander's nose lengthened visibly. He had lost it. I had one indeed. I had, Mr. Policeman. It's not likely they let you start without it. I am passing the farm. You may walk with me. Can I come back too? inquired Pigling Bland. I see no reason, young sir. Your paper is all right. Pigling Blend did not like going on alone, and it was beginning to rain, but it was unwise to argue with the police. He gave his brother a peppermint and watched him out of sight. To conclude the adventures of Alexander, the policeman sauntered up to the house about tea-time, followed by a damp, subdued little pig. I disposed of Alexander in the neighborhood. He did fairly well when he had settled down. Pigling Blend went on alone dejectedly. He came to crossroads and a signpost. To Market Town, five miles. Over the hills, four miles. To Pettitoe's farm, three miles. Pigling Blend was shocked. There was little hope of sleeping in Market Town, and tomorrow was the hiring fair. It was deplorable to think how much time had been wasted by the frivolity of Alexander. He glanced wistfully along the road towards the hills, and then set off walking obediently the other way, buttoning up his coat against the rain. He had never wanted to go, and the idea of standing all by himself in a crowded market, to be stared at, pushed, and hired by some big, strange farmer, was very disagreeable. "'I wish I could have a little garden and grow potatoes,' said Pigling Bland. He put his cold hand in his pocket and felt his paper. He put his other hand in his other pocket and felt another paper. Alexander's! Pigling squealed, then ran frantically back, hoping to overtake Alexander and the policeman. He took a wrong turn, several wrong turns, and was quite lost. It grew dark. The wind whistled. The trees creaked and groaned. Pigling Bland became frightened and cried, Wee, 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 I can't find my way home. After an hour's wandering, he got out of the wood. The moon shone through the clouds, and Pigling Moor saw a country that was new to him. The road crossed a moor. Below was a wide valley with a river twinkling in the moonlight, and beyond, in misty distance, lay the hills. He saw a small wooden hut, made his way to it, and crept inside. I'm afraid it is a hen house. But what can I do? said Pigling Blend, wet and cold and quite tired out. Bacon and eggs! Bacon and eggs! clucked a hen on a perch. Trap, trap, trap. Cackle, cackle, cackle. scolded the disturbed cockerel. The market, the market. Chicken, chick. clucked a broody hen, roosting nest to him. Pigling Bland, much alarmed, determined to leave at daybreak. In the meantime, he and the hens fell asleep. In less than an hour, they were all awakened. The owner, Mr. Peter Thomas Piperson, came with a lantern and a hamper to catch six fowls to take to market in the morning. He grabbed the white hen roosting next to the cock. Then his eye fell upon Pigling Bland, squeezed up in a corner. He made a singular remark. Hello, here's another. Seized Pigling by the scruff of the neck and dropped him into the hamper. Then he dropped in five more dirty, kicking, cackling hens on top of Pigling Bland. The hamper containing six fowls and a young pig was no light weight. It was taken downhill, unsteadily, with jerks. Pigling, although nearly scratched to pieces, contrived to hide the papers and peppermints inside his clothes. At last the hamper was bumped down upon a kitchen floor. The lid was opened, and Pigling was lifted out. He looked up, blinking, and saw an offensive, ugly, elderly man, grinning from ear to ear. "'This one's come of himself, whatever,' said Mr. Piperson, turning Pigling's pockets inside out. He pushed the hamper into a corner, threw a sack over it to keep the hens quiet, put a pot on the fire, and unlaced his boots. Pigling Bland drew forward a copy stool and sat on the edge of it, shyly warming his hands. Mr. Piperson pulled off a boot and threw it against the wainscot at the further end of the kitchen. 
there was a smothered noise. Stand up, said Mr. Piperson. Pigling Bland warmed his hands and eyed him. Mr. Piperson pulled off the other boot and flung it after the first. Again there was a curious noise. Be quiet, will ye? said Mr. Piperson. Pigling Bland sat on the very edge of the copy stool. Mr. Piperson fetched meal from a chest and made porridge. It seemed to Pigling that something at the further end of the kitchen was taking a suppressed interest in the cooking, but he was too hungry to be troubled by noises. Mr. Piperson poured out three platefuls, for himself, for Pigling, and a third. After glaring at Pigling, he put away with much scuffling and locked up. Pigling Bland ate his supper discreetly. After supper, Mr. Piperson consulted an almanac and felt Pigling's ribs. It was too late in the season for curing bacon, and he grudged his meal. Besides, the hens had seen this pig. He looked at the small remains of a flitch, and then looked undecidedly at Pigling. "'You may sleep on the rug,' said Mr. Peter Thomas Piperson. Pigling Bland slept like a top. In the morning Mr. Piperson made more porridge. The weather was warmer. He looked to see how much meal was left in the chest, and seemed dissatisfied. "'You'll likely be moving on again,' said he to Pigling Bland. Before Pigling could reply, a neighbor, who was giving Mr. Piperson the hens a lift, whistled from the gate. Mr. Piperson hurried out with the hamper, and joining Pigling to shut the door behind him and not muddle with knot, or, "'I'll come back and skin ye,' said Mr. Piperson. It crossed Pigling's mind that if he had asked for a lift too, he might still have been in time for market, but he distrusted Peter Thomas. After finishing breakfast at his leisure, Pigling had a look round the cottage. Everything was locked up. He found some potato peelings in a bucket in the back kitchen. Pigling ate the peel and washed up the porridge plates in the bucket. He sang while he worked. Thomas's pipe made such a noise, he called up all the girls and boys. And they all ran to hear him play over the hills and far away. Suddenly a little smothered voice chimed in. Over the hills and a great way off, the wind shall blow my top nut off. Pigling Bland put down a plate which he was wiping and listened. After a long pause, Pigling went on tiptoe and peeped round the door into the front kitchen. There was nobody there. After another pause, Pigling approached the door of the locked cupboard and snuffed at the keyhole. It was quite quiet. After another long pause, Pigling pushed a peppermint under the door. It was sucked in immediately. In the course of the day, Pigling pushed in all the remaining six peppermints. When Mr. Piperson returned, he found Pigling sitting before the fire. He had brushed up the hearth and put on the pot to boil. The meal was not get edible. Mr. Piperson was very affable. He slapped Pigling on the back, made lots of porridge, and forgot to lock the meal chest. He did lock the cupboard door, but without properly shutting it. He went to bed early, and told Pigling on no account to disturb him before next day at twelve o'clock. Pigling Bland sat by the fire eating his supper. All at once at his elbow a little voice spoke. My name is Pigwig. Make me more porridge, please. Pigling Bland jumped and looked round. A perfectly lovely little black Berkshire pig stood smiling beside him. She had twinkly little screwed-up eyes, a double chin, and a short turned-up nose. She pointed at Pigling's plate. He hastily gave it to her and fled to the meal chest. How did you come here? asked Pigling Bland. Stolen, replied Pigwait, with her mouth full. Pigling helped himself to meal without scruple. What for? Bacon hams, replied Pigwig cheerfully. Why on earth don't you run away? exclaimed the horrified Pigling. I shall after supper, said Pigwig decidedly. Pigling Bland made more porridge and watched her shyly. She finished a second plate, got up, and looked about her, as though she were going to start. You can't go in the dark, said Pigling Bland. Pigwig looked anxious. Do you know your way by daylight? I know you can see this little white house from the hills across the river. Which way are you going, Mr. Pig? To market. I have two pig papers. I might take you to the bridge if you have no objection, said Pigling, much confused and sitting on the edge of his copy stool. Pigwig's gratitude was such, and she asked so many questions that it became embarrassing to Pigling Bland. He was obliged to shut his eyes and pretend to sleep. She became quiet, and there was a smell of peppermint. I thought you would eat in them, said Pigling, waking suddenly. Only the corners, replied Pigwig, studying the sentiments with much interest by the firelight. I wish you wouldn't. You might smell them through the ceiling, said the alarmed Pigling. Pigwig put the sticky peppermints back into her pocket. Sing something, she demanded. I'm sorry, I have too thick, said Pigling, much dismayed. I will sing, replied Pigwig. You will not 
mind if I say itty titty. I have forgotten some of the words. Pigling Bland made no objection. He sat with his eyes half shut and watched her. She wagged her head and rocked about, clapping time and singing in a sweet little grunty voice. A funny old mother pig lived in a sty, and two little piggies had she. Tie itty itty, umph, umph, umph. And the little pig said, wee, wee. She sang successfully through three or four verses, only at every verse her head nodded a little lower, and her twinkly eyes closed up. Those three little piggies grew peaky and lean and lean. They might very well be, for somehow they couldn't say umph, umph, umph. And they wouldn't say wee, 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 for somehow they couldn't say. Pigwig's head bobbed lower and lower, until she rolled over a little round ball, fast asleep on the hearth rug. Pigling Bland on tiptoe covered her with an antimacassar. He was afraid to go to sleep himself, for the rest of the night he sat listening to the chirping of the crickets and the snores of Mr. Piperson overhead. Early in the morning, between dark and daylight, Pigling tied up his little bundle and woke up Pigwig. She was excited and half frightened. But it's dark. How can we find our way? The cock has crowed. We must start before the hens come out. They might shout to Mr. Piperson. Pigwig sat down again and commenced to cry. Come away, Pigwig. We can see it when they get used to it. Come, I can hear the hens clucking. Pigwing had never said shoot to a hen in his life, being peaceable. Also, he remembered the hamper. He opened the door quietly and shut it after them. There was no garden. The neighborhood of Mr. Piperson's was all scratched up by fowls. They slipped away hand in hand across an untidy field to the road. The sun rose while they were crossing the moor, a dazzle of light over the tops of the hills. The sunshine crept down the slopes into the peaceful green valleys, where little white cottages nestled in gardens and orchards. "'That's Westmoreland,' said Pigwig. She dropped Pigling's hand and commenced to dance, singing, "'Tom, Tom, the piper's son, stole a pig, and away he ran. But all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. Come, Pigwig, we must get to the bridge before folks are stirring. Why do you want to go to the market, Pigling? inquired Pigwig presently. I don't want. I want to go to potatoes. Have a peppermint, said Pigwig. Pigling Bland refused quite crossly. Does your poor toothy hurt? inquired Pigwig. Pigling Bland grunted. Pigwig ate the peppermint herself and followed the opposite side of the road. Pigwig, keep under the wall. There's a man ploughing. Pigwig crossed over. They hurried downhill toward the county boundary. Suddenly Pigling stopped. He heard wheels. Slowly jogging up the road below them came a tradesman's cart. The reins flapped on the horse's back. The grocer was reading a newspaper. Take that peppermint out of your mouth. Pigwig, we may have to overrun. Don't say one word. Leave it to me, and in sight of the bridge," said poor Pigling, nearly crying. He began to walk frightfully lame, holding Pigwig's arm. The grocer, intent upon his paper, might have passed them if his horse had not shied and snorted. He pulled the cart crossways and held down his whip. "Hello, where are you going to?" Pigling Bland stared at him vacantly. "Are you deaf? Are you going to market?" Pigling nodded slowly. I thought it was yesterday. Show me your license. Pigling stared at the off hind shoe of the grocer's horse, which had picked up a stone. The grocer flicked his whip. Take this, take lessons. Pigling fumbled in all his pockets and handed up the papers. The grocer read them, but seemed still dissatisfied. The shoe pig is a young lady. Is her name... Alexander. Pigwig opened her mouth and shut it again. Pigling coughed asthmatically. The grocer ran his finger down the advertisement column of the newspaper. Lost Jordan O'Shea, ten shillings a word. He looked suspiciously at Pigwig. Then he stood up in the trap and whistled for the plowman. You wait here. I drive on and speak to him said the grocer, gathering up the reins. He knew that pigs are slippery, but surely such a very lame pig could never run. Not yet, Pigwig. He will look back. The grocer did so. He saw the two pigs stock still in the middle of the road. 
Then he looked over at his horse's heels. It was lame also. The stone took some time to knock out after he got to the plowman. Now, pig, wait now, said Pigling Bland. Never did any pigs run as these pigs ran. They raced and squealed and pelted down the long white hill towards the bridge. Little fat pigwig's petticoats fluttered, and her feet went pitter-patter-pitter pitter, as she bounded and jumped. They ran, and they ran, and they ran down the hill, and across a short cut on the level green turf at the bottom between pebble beds and rushes. They came to the river, they came to the bridge, they crossed it hand in hand, then over the hills and far away she danced with pigling bland. The End End of section 13section 14 of a collection of beatrix potter stories by beatrix potter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org section 14 the tale of two bad mice narrator read by dolly pinaroles tom thumb read by johnny smith hunka munka read by esther ben simonides the little girl read by Rosalind. Nurse read by Eldelze Pinaroles for W. M. L. W., the little girl who had the dollhouse. Once upon a time, there was a very beautiful doll's house. It was red brick with white windows, and it had real muslin curtains, and a front door, and a chimney. It belonged to two dolls called Lucinda and Jane. At least, it belonged to Lucinda, but she never ordered meals. Jane was the cook, but she never did any cooking, because the dinner had been bought ready-made in a box full of shavings. There were two red lobsters, and a ham, a fish, a pudding, and some pears and oranges. They would not come off the plates, but they were extremely beautiful. One morning Lucinda and Jane had gone out for a drive in the doll's perambulator. There was no one in the nursery, and it was very quiet. Presently there was a little scuffling, scratching noise in a corner near the fireplace, where there was a hole under the skirting board. Tom Thumb put his head out for a moment, and then popped it in again. Tom Thumb was a mouse. A minute afterwards, Hunka Munka, his wife, put her head out too, and when she saw that there was no one in the nursery, she ventured out on the oilcloth under the coal box. The doll's house stood at the other side of the fireplace. Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka went cautiously across the hearth rug. They pushed the front door. It was not fast. Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka went upstairs and peeped into the dining room. Then they squeaked with joy. Such a lovely dinner was laid out upon the table. There were tin spoons and lead knives and forks and two dolly chairs all so convenient. Tom Thumb set to work at once to carve the ham. It was a beautiful shiny yellow streaked with red. The knife crumpled up and hurt him. He put his finger in his mouth. It is not boiled enough. It is hard. You have a try, Hunka Munka. Hunka Munka stood up in her chair and chopped at the ham with another lead knife. It's as hard as the ham's at the cheesemongers, said Hunka Munka. The ham broke off the plate with a jerk and rolled under the table. Let it alone said tom thumb give me some fish hunka munka hunka munka tried every tin spoon in turn the fish was glued to the dish then tom thumb lost his temper he put the ham in the middle of the floor and hit it with the tongs and with the shovel bang bang smash smash the ham flew all into pieces for underneath the shiny paint it was made of nothing but plaster then there was no end to the rage and disappointment of tom thumb and hunka munka they broke up the pudding, the lobsters, the pears, and the oranges. As the fish would not come off the plate, they put it into the red-hot crinkly paper fire in the kitchen, but it would not burn either. Tom Thumb went up the kitchen chimney and looked out at the top. There was no suit. While Tom Thumb was up the chimney, Hunka Munka had another disappointment. She found some tiny canisters upon the dresser labeled rice, coffee, sago, but when she turned them upside down, there was nothing inside except red and blue beads. Then those mice set to work to do all the mischief they could, especially Tom Thumb. He took Jane's clothes out of the chest of drawers in her bedroom, and he threw them out of the top floor window. But Hunka Munka had a frugal mind. After pulling half the feathers out of Lucinda's bolster, she remembered that she herself was in want of a feather bed. With Tom Thumb's assistance, she carried the bolster downstairs and across the hearth rug. It was difficult to squeeze the bolster into a mouse hole, but they managed somehow. Then Hunka Munka went back and fetched a chair, a bookcase, a bird cage, and several small odds and ends. The bookcase and the bird cage refused to go into the mouse hole. Hunka Munka left them behind the coal box and went to fetch a cradle. Hunka Munka was just returning with another chair when suddenly there was a noise of talking outside upon the landing. The mice rushed back to their hole and the dolls came into the nursery. What a sight met the eyes of Lucinda and Jane. 
Lucinda sat upon the upset kitchen stove and stared, and Jane leaned against the kitchen dresser and smiled, but neither of them made any remark. The bookcase and the birdcage were rescued from under the coal box, but Hunkamunka has got the cradle and some of Lucinda's clothes. She has also some useful pots and pans and several other things. The little girl that the doll's house belonged to said, I will get a doll just like a policeman. But the nurse said, I will set a mouse trap. So that is the story of the two bad mice, but they were not so very, very naughty after all, because Tom Thumb paid for everything he broke. He found a crooked sixpence under the hearth rug, and upon Christmas Eve, he and Hunkamunka stuffed it into the one of the stockings of Lucinda and Jane. And very early every morning, before anybody is awake, Hunkamunka comes with her dustpan and her broom to sweep the dolly's house. The End End of chapter 14 End of a collection of Beatrix Potter stories by Beatrix Potter.